I now awake to a living nightmare. I'm in a warehouse. I see people strapped to the bed, screaming. I look around and see people wearing tracksuits. In the background, I see these people holding a man down who is wide awake whilst they operate without anesthetic. Four of them approach my bed and attempt to hold me down. One of them is holding a scalpel. I am terrified and begin screaming. This has no effect. They continue to hold me. They tell me I'm in hospital. I refuse to believe them. Why they're wearing tracksuits? Why are they operating on people without anesthetic? I'm not a violent man nor someone used to confrontation, but such was my fear I began to attack them believing I was fighting for my life. I then began dem demanding to speak to my wife, such was my delirium. A doctor contacted her and asked her to speak to me. He advised her he had given me something to settle me, but it had not worked. My wife concerned, confirms that she spoke that she spoke to the doctor that night. Sorry, spoke to me that night, but I have no recollection of it. I'm now laying in bed in acceptance of the fact that I'm in hospital. I'm in a trance looking out of a window. In the near distance, I see a building. I stare at it, and the next thing that happens is that the building fragments and pieces begin to float in the sky, like a scene from the Wizard of Oz. By virtue of the fact I knew nothing about delirium, I felt moved to write about my experience. I have learned that delirium manifests itself in different forms and my experience is my, my experience alone. It makes uncomfortable reading and has provoked many emotions. I feel, but I feel better for writing it and hope it is of benefit to the board. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Like a lot of people with a cancer diagnosis, my immediate thoughts were of pain and death. These thoughts have now been relegated to the back of my mind, principally for two reasons. Firstly, my cancer is stable, but secondly, the spectre of delirium has replaced my worries. Yes, I'm more frightened of experiencing delirium than I am facing cancer. There is a high probability that I may need surgery for my cancer at some stage. Whilst the thought of this is daunting, I'm stoic by nature and have overcome many health problems in the past. However, I'm more terrified of experiencing delirium than an operation itself. Therefore, I concluded that unless my life depends on it, I would rather live with pain than face delirium once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, very powerful to hear your experience and um, and I guess the thing that stands out from all of that, John, is that your fear of delirium again um, is actually and has actually impacted on the decisions you make about your health and, and operations moving forward. So um, really powerful for everyone to hear that, um, because I think sometimes as clinicians and I, and I am a mental health nurse, we don't really understand the impact it has on individuals. A couple of questions, John, if that's OK. Um, and, and this is because I think the audience may may really want to hear this from you. And, and certainly in the chat, people are saying a very powerful story. And thank you for sharing, John. If this was to happen again in, uh, in terms of delirium, what could staff have done differently to support you, do you think? What would have made a difference? That's I think that's really what would be valuable. Um, well, this time round, the next time round, you know, if I do have to go in, what's call it, I'd, I'd be prepared. I'd be able to tell them that, you know, I've suffered from dementia, explain what happened to me. So, you know, th there is that awareness that I could get, I could um, give now. But um, out of everybody that I had contact with when I was experiencing delirium, the one that, that sticks out in my mind who knew exactly what to do was a physiotherapist, you know, just gently rubbing my shoulders, talking to me gently, you know, uh, it didn't bring me out of my delirium, but it, it, it brought me down to earth kind of thing. Um, in fact, we've had a question come in, John, if it's OK to ask that. And um, it's um, and one that I was probably going to ask as well, which is, well, two questions from from Jenny. And thank you. What advice would you give to others um, who may go on to experience delirium and their families? 
Um, so, you know, for people that do experience that, um, any thoughts on what you would be saying? And I guess that's why you're happy to deliver this session today, aren't you? It's that message getting out, John. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the first things I would say is, what's called it, if you, if you feel that you, you're going to have delirium, A, uh, I've returned to, you know, what's called let medical staff know because they can then be prepared. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, yeah, and also, what's called it, um, sorry, I've lost my train. Can you repeat the question again, please? It's okay, John. I was just thinking, because we've talked about this before, sometimes it's what families can do to prepare as well. What do you think could have helped your wife, for example, in that in that situation? Well, at the time, things were very difficult because we were right at the height of COVID. So um, she, but there was no visiting at the hospital or an, uh, anything like that. However, they, they did have to make an, an exception because I, I was so bad, they couldn't, they couldn't settle me. So the, what's called it, they thought that uh, me, if my wife came down, she could help them kind of thing. But I, I mean, my, me personally, I think what's called it, my, mine and similar stories should be used as templates kind of thing. So people, mm -hmm. you know, may be written in, in a kind of form for want of a better expression, but making people aware of what dementia is and, you know, what, what you may face. And, Thank you. Very um, much. And, and um, Valium, you know, what's called it, to keep, to keep people calm. So, yes, so, so medication may have helped you, um, you think, as well, but also um, staff interventions to help as well. One of the questions that's come in, um, it's actually come in from a colleague, Jonathan Kay, um, Who's asked? Um, did did anyone ever explain the cause of your delirium to you, John? Have you ever had that opportunity to discuss that? Um, nobody, nobody's ever discussed it. You know, it's um, in conversations. I'm the only one speaking other than like with Dementia United, and you know, through through opportunities such as this. But like my GP and you know, subsequent uh, doctors, like I've had a couple of. Um, consultations with the, the this the surgeon who uh, performed the operation and whilst the subject of dementia is broached there's never a meaningful conversation about it and I think we need to uh, um, what's called it um, yeah it, it, sorry what's called it it's, the um, train of thought's gone it's OK, John. I think we've said before now that you, you've always wanted to share your experience and the message that you wanted to get out to people is that um, sharing lived experience is, is so powerful and can make a difference. And you very kindly have provided a recording of, of you reading this out and, and we will um, share that in the slides. And um, if we don't mind having the next slide, um, please, Fiona, because, um, you know, it's just it's just to highlight the value that um, some of the people that have listened to your experience, John, have really found hearing from you has opened up their eyes <clears throat> to what the lived experience can be. And I think what, John, you've always wanted to say is share that lived experience, share the recording that you've done, the transcript, the interview with <clears throat> yourself and your wife about your experience. <clears throat> and we've got lots of other ones because they are so valuable a resource um, in terms of people's understanding about the impact of delirium. So, um, and in turn, one of the questions, John, was about the trauma. How have you managed that traumatic experience? What's helped? Uh, well, so, excuse me. Oh, you're on mute, John, we can't hear you. Yeah. Given the opportunity of speaking about it, it's like a form of counselling. Now, you know, with that in mind, you, what's call it, other people, you know, who do, do experience, because it's like post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, and um, I, I think about it on a daily basis, you know, it has, it has affected me permanently. I can't see it ever going away. You know, it is, you know, quite a significant memory. 
Mm. But like, um, I think it's important, like, for 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 the staff members that were on duty the the night that I had really had bad delirium, where I you know I saw them um, um, operating on the man without anaesthetic. You know, I feel for like people like that, they should, you know, share their, their expertise, you know, the knowledge they gain. So I'm sure that, you know, after experiencing what they witnessed, they will have gone out and done some research themselves. A really good point to make, actually, about staff awareness around the impact and, and how, how you presented. So thank you very much for sharing today. There's lots of lovely messages in the chat, John, really saying thank you. Very powerful. Um, and I'm going to now hand over to our chair because I think we've gone over our time, but I think it was valuable to hear from John. So I'm so sorry, Emma. I will cut down my presentations That's later. Fine. I know it it will work itself out. Important to uh, to answer some of those questions and thank you, Helen and John. So um, moving on, um, introducing Dr. Scott Mather, who is a consultant geriatrician at Manchester Royal Firm, Royal Infirmary. And I will also just mention he appears to be the clinical lead for everything there, as far as I can ascertain. Dementia, delirium, frailty. So um, we're in fantastic company and he's going to talk to us about um, what delirium is and why it's so important. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Emma. And certainly thanks, John, for that really important opening to the webinar today. I certainly, I know it's not easy to relive these events, but I think it's so important that we think about delirium and the patients it affects and the people that have to live with it afterwards. So I know it's not easy, but but thank you for your insight. Um, it really allows us to frame the rest of the discussion of what we're really trying to, to do and what we're here for. So as Emma said, I'm uh, Dr Scott Mather, I am clinical lead here at MRI, but I'm also trust lead, so that's for the whole of MFT for delirium and dementia, alongside one of the directors of nursing and co-lead for frailty, as she said. What I'm going to do over the next 10 minutes or so is just frame the conversation that we're going to go on to have. And just to remind everyone, I know most people here will know what delirium is and will have heard exactly how patients and people experience it, but it's important that we have a think about it so that we frame the rest of these discussions. So this is from the NHS. Delirium is defined as a common clinical syndrome characterised by disturbed consciousness, so often those sleep-wake cycles that we see, cognitive function, so often the memory can be very heavily affected, or perception of your surroundings. It comes on acutely and it often fluctuates as well, so we often see patients get worse later in the day. It can usually develop relatively quickly over a few days. There are a couple of very well recognised subtypes, which I think over years to come will probably start as the research develops. We'll be looking at these potentially as separate conditions with separate treatments. But at the moment, we categorise them all under delirium. So we've got hyperactive delirium, the type that really uh, was being described so eloquently to us before, where people have a very heightened sense of arousal, can be quite restless, agitated and aggressive. And we see this very commonly post patients, um, following patients operations or uh, often on our hip fracture units. But we also see hypoactive delirium, which is often under recognised where people can become withdrawn, quiet or sleepy. Next slide, please. This is the kind of formal definition from the DSM-5. We also have the ICD definitions, but certainly this really categorizes what I've just said, but in a little bit more detail. As you can see, it focuses on a disturbance of attention, so not being aware of your environment and being disorientated. The shortness of its presentation, which compares with dementia and other syndromes, which have a much longer preceding time, and that tendency to fluctuate. We do know with some dementias it can fluctuate as well, but it is characteristic of delirium. We know that there is a disturbance in cognition, so memory, disorientation, language, all those things go alongside with it. But one of the things that DMSM5 adds, which I think is helpful, especially when we were just listening to, to John's story, is that usually delirium is caused by something else. So post-operatively, infections, dehydration, and it really gives medical practitioners um, that that frame really to go away and think, well, what is leading to this? How can we try and prevent it? How can we put in place a better form of care to try and reduce the, risk, the likelihood of patients developing delirium in our care? Next slide, please. Delirium is common. About one in four pa older patients in hospital will have or develop delirium during their inpatient stay. 
That varies in different units. So clearly, if you come to one of my older person's units here at Manchester Royal Infirmary, the rate of delirium's 50 to 60 percent during the inpatient stay, so much higher because we've got a much higher instance of vulnerable populations. And across the hospital, that varies as well. Very high in our orthopaedic wards because we've got a very frail cohort there, but then lower in some of our other areas. Within the intensive care department, again, rates can range right up to about 80 percent, but it is variable across across the hospital, but bear in mind every older person can be at risk of delirium, as younger people can be as well, but clearly it's not quite as high. Next slide. The main risks. Any cognitive decline is relevant for delirium. So yes, having a history of dementia is important, but we know through recent evidence that patients who have any form of decline in their Montreal scores when they're doing their MOCA prior to an operation have an increased risk of delirium. We know for every age over 65, every year additionally over the age of 65, your risk of delirium goes up by about one to two percent. We know if you've got multimorbidity and there's lots of evidence around cardiovascular disease and everything else that increases your risk of delirium. Frailty, the evidence is not quite as strong in this area, but we know with recent linking studies that frailty is a risk factor for delirium. And finally, medications. It's not that surprising that patients with multimorbidity and lots of medications can have side effects to those medications. And if we're starting opiates, the commonest cause in the book is that patients can get confused after that. So definitely medications can have a factor. Next slide, please. But why does it matter? And I think John put it so eloquently. Um, before it, ha it really, before I'll go to the bottom point on this slide before I'll return to the top, is it has a profound impact on the person and not just the person but also their family's experience of care and as John's saying it has profound impacts for a long period of time and we have studies shown that patients can develop post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of delirium and I feel that's really important to put at the centre of why we need to implement procedures to prevent delirium. I believe it's a moral imperative of the care that we offer to reduce the risk of developing delirium in hospital. And as we know with carers and family members, witnessing a relative go through that start, that amount of confusion can be incredibly distressing um, and can be difficult for those people too. For outcomes, it has a huge impact. So we know it at least doubles the risk of death in hospital. We've got plenty of studies from pneumonia to intensive care which demonstrate that. Um, and as it's something we can reduce and hopefully prevent in many cases, clearly that's going to improve complications rates. We know that people who have or develop delirium in hospital have an increased risk of going to care homes, an increased length of hospital stay, and in a slightly a, a more debatable area of evidence, but there is an increased chance of developing long-term dementia or cognitive impairments. One of the things that's also closest to my heart as well is the increased risk of hospital complications, so falls, fractures, pressure areas, catheters, everything that goes alongside a prolonged stay in hospital, which we know our patients and their relatives can suffer. And it's really important that we try and prevent it for not just the complications, not just the risk of death, but also for the individual to try and prevent patients and people like John developing the same experience. Next slide. So I just in the last couple of moments, I know I, I know we're running a little a couple of minutes behind now, was just to talk about screening and what we're doing at MFT, because this is a best practice webinar. At MFT, I believe that all patients should be screened for delirium on a daily basis. That is where we've started and that's where we hope to get to. Clearly, the 4AT is a very it, it takes a couple of minutes to do so on every older person potentially is not achievable, but we've moved to using the squid on every patient who's admitted to our hospital 65 and older. And then if that's positive, moving on to the 4AT. Clearly for anyone with concerns, the 4AT will be the first tool. The CAM is also there. And for any colleagues in intensive care, the CAM ICU is still where the evidence sits in that situation. Next slide. What we're hoping to do in the next couple of weeks is since uh, we've moved on to a new electronic health record called Hive run by the computer program Epic, we have now developed a patient safety dashboard. So down to the hospital and ward level, I can get compliance with 
the squids, check the patients are being assessed for delirium, check that the 4AT is then done, and then check that actually they're having their delirium bundle completed. Next slide. What I want to do is move from auditing this on a global scale once every year, once every X amount of time and move it to not just a quality improvement approach, but to a real time monitoring approach so that we can see where our patients with delirium are within the hospital. We can ensure that we see where the problem areas are and we can put into place plans across our kind of almost 3000 adult beds across our trust and try and prevent delirium and reduce stories like John in future. Next slide. Um, and next slide, yeah, thank you. Just back to the that one there. So as you can see, what I can then do is hopefully pull data down to ward level, how many patients have been assessed for delirium in the last 24 hours and get the exact numbers and really start to pull graphs like this on a daily basis for our patients. And I believe that when we think of this moral imperative to prevent delirium, we also need to ensure that our screening is robust so that for patients who do develop delirium in our in, in hospital and we know they potentially have a worse outcome in terms of length of stays, that's what some of the data suggests, and then also with complications, we know that trying to act in hospital on a daily basis is potentially more relevant than simply screening on admission. I want to move it to a much more regular process that happens in the same way that we do our observations as part of our standard care. Next slide. So that's me finished. That's a little bit of sharing really at the end there for what we're doing at MFT, what we're doing as a trust to try and prevent delirium is a whole other piece of work and certainly meetings I have on a regular basis. But it's really important that we move, we think about the why delirium happens, what patients are at risk of it, why it matters and why we need to do something about it. Because ultimately to improve the journey for our patients, for their carers and for anyone using healthcare services across the country. We need to think about how we prevent it and how we ensure that John's story is less common in future and make sure that we can try and ensure that we share those risks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Scott, and I, I think you're taking it to the next level, which is exactly where it needs to go in terms of that real time um, monitoring. And I haven't heard of anyone else talking about that before. So this is really excellent work um, and I'd like to talk to you a bit more about it <laughs> the time. Um, so I can see there's a, a question in the chat asking, could the tools that you're talking about, could they be used in the community? So the tools we're, we're talking about are relatively simple tools, so they can definitely be used in the community. So in terms of Dementia United and all the tools that have been developed already, we are simply adapting tried and tested methods yeah. of prevention or uh, preventing delirium and hopefully then reducing the risk of someone develops delirium. So without a doubt, these are approaches that can be used across the board. It, it, they're simple things. What we're not asking yeah. for is, is staff to, to really change the way they're working. As part of the news too, they're asking about confusion anyway. And a lot of our community providers are trained to the, do, do the news too. And actually as part of the National Early Warning Score system, confusion is part of that. And if you find out someone's confused, then you should move through the the same approach that Dementia United and all the other the work that's been done in this area from the Edinburgh team is then moving on to the 4AT and moving on to really coming up with a care bundle for these patients which can be adapted in, in any setting really including at home not just in um, care homes and intermediate care. Fantastic thank you um, I see you've put your contact details for any further questions um, and I don't know if you're able to stay for a, a, a bit more of an extended Q&A at the end, but if you are, you're very welcome. If you need to rush off, that's fine too. And um, thanks for your contact I'll details. I'll do my Thank best. Thank you so Thanks. much. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to um, move on to introduce um, Helen. Um, all of you will know Helen, um, one of our... Um, who's been instrumental in all the delirium work in Greenwich and Manchester as part of Dementia United. Mental health nurse by background, project manager and all things delirium sort of spreading the word and part of the movement that we've got going in Greater Manchester. So um, take it away um, in introduction to all the resources that are available of which there are an increasing number. Thank you, Helen. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to try and um, get through this fairly quickly so we can get on to the people who are joining us today talking about their wonderful best practice. But what a great um, start we've had to the webinar with John's lived experience and, and Scott sort of framing everything for us and moving into that best practice. Um, what I would say is, I think there's a couple of questions that have come up in the chat, Emma. One of them is the, about the community setting. And um, one of the presenters later on in, in today's webinar is actually talking about that implementation in the community setting, Joanne. So hopefully we can answer that question for you. Okie dokie. So um, Dementia United, who are we? We are a Greater Manchester's programme for um, quality improvement and uh, we work alongside a wide range of partners and stakeholders as you can see from this slide. As I've put in the chat we have a programme of work and you can click onto that and have a look because we're much wider than delirium but that just gives you the context of, of who we are and who we work with on behalf of the Greater Manchester Integrated Care programme. So uh, partnership. Um, next slide please. So uh, when we started work, um, Emma Vardy was leading this um, before my time in 2018, a number of events were hosted um, across Greater Manchester, free events where we developed a community of practice and we um, worked on agreeing what we called the Greater Manchester approach to delirium and then moved from that into um, agreeing some standards that we want to work to across Greater Manchester. And this slide highlights our key standards that underpin all of the work that we've been doing, the toolkits, the resources that I'm about to show you. So it's just to highlight that this is what we're working to. It is work in progress. Some of these standards we've met, some of them we're still working on and plan to do over, over a, a period of time. So next slide um, please Fiona and we can sort of just talk through some of those how have we delivered on them or what resources have we got available next slide thank you so the standards around promotion of public facing information really important particularly as we started out with John's lived experience I think it's to highlight that co-production has been at the heart of the work that we're doing. So what we have been able to develop with that co-production with people with lived experience is fabulous public facing leaflets and resources which you'll be able to use. We've also done some work with John and colleagues and created a delirium zine. Those of you that may not know what a zine is, it's a fabulous um, way of us actually putting our experiences down on paper, our lived experiences, and it addresses that um, inclusivity and importance of people sharing their experiences in lots of different ways. So we've got that to share as well. And also we've got a lovely presentation coming up, so I won't steal anybody's thunder, but we've um, translated our leaflets into 16 languages and lots of different resources. Next slide, please. So um, standard two is making sure that everybody um, that's submitted into an organisation um, is assessed for um, delirium if they're over 65 or have a, an underlying cognitive impairment dementia diagnosis. Following on from Scott's presentation, it's wonderful that that work's been taken forward um, in Manchester um, NHS Foundation Trust. There's also work going on at the moment in Tameside, um, implementing using the tools that Scott mentioned, the single question in delirium, the squid and the 4AT. I've put some links to those in the chat. And Salford have also done some work on that. So again, that's work in progress. We have a hospital toolkit. So those of you that have joined us from hospital settings, you'll be able to click in and have a look at those resources that you may be able to use and take forward discussions to uh, en enable you to look at um, implementing these within your organisations. Next slide, please. And then um, looking at the pathways. So um, again, all organisations to have a pathway for delirium across Greater Manchester. We've got two wonderful toolkits that include how to assess, um, systematically approach the causes of delirium, and then how to manage and treat and support somebody either living in the community or in hospital. And those, those support guidance management documents that we've provided can be used to frame care plans, um, however you want to use them to guide your um, work that you're doing in supporting people. So, um, so hopefully you'll find them of value and the links are there, but also we've got the leaflets, as I've mentioned um, before. The other thing to say is that we piloted the community toolkit in the community in five localities and we were able to successfully keep 70% of people with delirium at home. So we're building on that and there's a couple of links to some of the great examples from other localities. Next slide. Thank you. So um, every, oh, have we not moved? 
Oh, I don't know, it's not moved over, has it? Um, a standardised pathway. Um, I think we may have mentioned that one. Next slide, please, Fiona. Hello, is this my presentation now? Um, no, oh yes, that's it. So um, over to you, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I need to stop and say um, say something about coming to an end. So all of those resources are in the slides. We'll be sharing them all afterwards. You'll get a copy of everything with all the links. You can click on and find everything. And I'll also put stuff in the chat and I'll stop talking. And I'm going to hand over now to um, David, who's going to start his presentation. And I guess, David, you'll then introduce colleagues. So many thanks. Hello, hello everybody. Um, thank you for coming to the cinema today. It's been a tremendous privilege to be presenting today on behalf of Bolton NHS Trust. So my name's David Nielsen. I'm the Senior Admiral Nurse, um, Dementia Specialist Nurse for the Trust. And I'm here with my colleague Ella Brenner, who is the Senior Enhanced Care Practitioner for the Trust as well. So we have two different variations on a theme for dementia and delirium. So I'm going to do the first half and I know I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm going to go on. So um, can you have the next slide, please? <laughs> oh, sorry, I better put myself on the camera. Thank you. Huge, ap <laughs> huge apologies. Just had a call from the hospital about some blood results. So, yes, the Bolton team. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm just an sorry. awful chair, an awful oh, chair. Oh, you're, you're doing a wonderful job, Emma. <laughs> Don't worry, thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma. But no, absolutely. I mean... But we kind of just introduced ourselves, so don't worry. Um, so the overview of Bolton HS Trust is a trust. Um, we're an acute trust that covers Bolton as part of the surrounding area. So we cover parts of Salford, Berry, Wigan, Blackburn, outlying areas. We have a tremendously busy a &E department. We have acute medical, acute surgical wards. We have specialist wards as well. And we're an integrated community and social care trust. We have approximately 750 beds and approximately 5,200 staff on site and within the trust. Um, we have one big hospital that covers the area, so we don't have any kind of outlying hospitals. We are one hospital and we have a range of hubs, nursing therapy and community services out in the community as well. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So it's my um, job as Admiral Nurse because Admiral Nurses differ slightly from dementia specialist nurses. We look after families, looking after people living with dementia. Um, I developed training and, and uh, adhere to standards within the trust and to go with them um, dementia guidelines. So it was my job with them um, with, um, help from the frailty team and the simulation team to come up with some simulation, dementia simulation training, which incorporates delirium as well in a big way. So the overview of the training is delirium to dementia simulation is delivered at tier three. So we introduced to give a more interactive collaboration platform for learning. And we use the VAX, VARC system, which is video or show reading kinetic approach. So rather than just sitting watching a PowerPoint presentation where people become disengaged, they may not interact, they may turn off, they may look at their iPhones, they may look at a whole load of different things. We want them to try and stay engaged with the learning. So what we did, we did in two sessions, so I did my theory stuff, so I did the video and audio, and then we had a simulation in the second part of the programme, which they put their skills into practice. Oh, sorry, can you go back to the... Um, yeah, sorry, can you go back, sorry, the next slide, please. So as over four hours in two parts, um, let us expect to let practice, yep, next slide, please. Thank you. And the aims of the training. So the aims of the training is to identify the main themes of dementia and delirium and apply this to practice. So we have three scenarios. We have a hyperactive delirium with dementia, hypoactive delirium, dementia, and mixed dementia. And then we build on the line of stress and equipment for the management of the dementia and delirium situation. So we do this within a controlled environment, within a classroom, um, and take them away from the exposures of the war to help them develop that practice and to incorporate it. We promote the use of the hospital screening tool, which is like the 4AT, which we're rolling out. Um, it was only medics who used to do the 4AT, Bolton NHS Foundation Trust, but now we're rolling out to nurses in the ward. Um, the Pinch Me, Squid and John's campaign to help promote and um, support, to get them an understanding of all these tools that would help him, helping somebody living with delirium in the hospital and what we can use. So for John's campaign, one of the things is how, who would um, be the main stakeholder in getting to know this person with delirium, the family, phone, phone the family, phone the husband, phone the wife, phone the son, phone the daughter, bring them up to the hospital and get our information, get off the phone, Squid, 
Again, that the single question question to identify delirium, use the pinch mix, including environmental factors such as medication, environment, hydration, dehydration. Again, to know that because sometimes when people come in for a accident emergency, they may be dehydrated or constipated and have a delirium in the community, and they've come into hospital and the 4AT, which we're trying to get exposure to. So they actually have to walk through the 4AT. <laughs> Um, it promotes spread and um, spread the knowledge and learning within the workforce. So we are aiming at clinical staff who are on the wards and who have been exposed to patients and we've come across people living with delirium and dementia. And we allow the participants to share the practice at the end and uncover an issue. So at the end of the day, we have a debrief, see what everybody's learned and we do shared learning for that. We promote and develop modern workforce in the challenge of the 21st century. So we kind of keep standards up to date, nice guidelines, all that, and maybe keep up to date with current practice. Can I have the next slide, please? So the advantages of this simulation training, so it builds confidence in team bonding. Also, we're doing it in a safe environment. So it's basically, it's all controlled. So our actor who comes in and is one of our volunteers is fit and healthy. He hasn't actually got delirium and dementia, he's just acting. So it gives them the, the actual exposure of delirium and dementia without actually, with, with a live person. So it's really, really controlled. And, uh, and it builds character and it promotes leadership skills as well. So they're having to think on their feet, they have to say if somebody comes through the, the ward with A&E &E, uh, &E or the ward and the, the present list, we have no information. How would we build that information? How would we collect that information? Where would phone the family? We would do the 480, we get the pinch me, we would talk to the person, we would try and get them orientated and that type of thing. It's all the skills that we would use every day. Um, we keep the audience interested and stimulation to get the message across. So, the, the, so even though we do, um, classes of 20 to 30 participants. It's a bit much of a simulation because we try to keep it small groups, but because of our workforce, there's only me, one frailty nurse, and um, the simulation nurse, because of our, our low workforce, we have to have bigger groups, but they are ma managing. So we'd have two maybe participants come out, and then the rest of the crowd would kind of shout out and say, say what they would do, and they would put that learning into practice. It allows the and also, again, back to the feedback, it allows the learners to give constructive feedback and facilitate the group to learn and develop. So not only just for um, feedback for the, the participants, but also feedback and learning from us, because this is pretty new. Um, we've been doing it both to Foundation Trust with the simulation training. So uh, we are getting a lot of feedback. We're getting a lot of um, good news. Sometimes we're getting things like people are feeling overwhelmed. So sometimes when we're doing the introductions, it's just to say it's, a, it's not a a judgment on acting skills or a judgment in practice. We're here to learn, we're here to share, and we're here to be non judgmental in that learning environment. And also, it's by as candidates to do well and get positive pressures and to achieve their learning successes as well and go past a part of the PDP plan for um, re validation and for extra learning. Can I have the next slide, please? So the disadvantages of this simulation chain, which we've come across here in Bolton, the candidates may be never performing in front of an audience. As I said before, we have got cohorts of about maybe 20 to 30 candidates in the, in the class, and sometimes that can be overwhelming to the participants. Um, we have appetizer simulation training um, strategies, so people know it's a simulation, but still, they still tend to be a bit nervous until they get into the swing of it. Some may not take it seriously. Some people might just say, well, it's just, it's not real. It's just an actor and that. So they might be saying, well, it's not really um, relevant. But what we do, we do try to say that you could come across this in the wards in the A&E department. And these are the skills that we are giving you to facilitate that, um, that learning to, to, to go and enhance the patient experience within our hospital. Depending on the numbers of training, it differs from a tentative facilitator. So sometimes the wards, clinical areas, community may not be able to um, release enough staff because of the pressures, workforce pressures. What we found is they were substituting the clin clinicians with student nurses. So at a cohort of about maybe 10, 12 student nurses, but maybe only three or four clinicians. So we, what we try to do is try to adapt it to say we need the clinicians or we need them. Um, members of staff from the trust and we would facilitate maybe a lesser cohort of students so maybe like three or four students so i was trying to get the balance right of our aim audience um, to um to get the learning out there um, um next slide please so the strategy incorporating the simulation training so it aims to promote the inclusion of the 480 for nursing staff as it was usually done by doctors and the clerk and I will give the inpatient staff skills and confidence to access and implement the four, four new 480 to determine a level of delay for patients and just give them um, that extra confidence just to have awareness of it and to um, implement it in practice. The admin 
as myself, as well as the simulation training, I'm doing satellite training on the wards and in uh, such areas to try and promote the 4AT to our nursing staff and to give them the confidence to use it as well as just to be that bit of extra support. And a strategy to incorporate these ways of working across a level with clinical staff and trust to allow better detection. So basically try to detect it or delay them a lot quicker and become a lot more effective with our treatment plans. It's working very well in the trust. So it's um, it seems to be advantages. I mean, but we are getting good feedback and we are on Twitter. Um, do we have the next slide, please? So is there any questions um, about the delirium simulation tier three at um, Bolton NHS Foundation Trust? I think there is a question in the chat, um, David. I've stepped in because Emma's just messaged me to say her Wi-Fi is now a problem for her in the care home as well as, as chair. Oh. So there's a question from um, somebody, I think, who works in Bolton saying, thank you, David, just to add that the 4AT is a significant item now in medical clerking and it leads to the time bundle at, at Bolton. So I think support really from colleagues in Bolton, which is lovely. So Gopal said that. Um, so, thank you, uh, Gopal. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's terrific so nothing at the moment if you want to introduce your colleagues david i have asked for people to put questions in the chat which they're very welcome to do so no worries so i'm going to introduce my co-worker ella from the enhanced care team she's going to be taking you over the enhanced care team and as hello aloha yes yes <laughs> So hello everybody, my name's Ella. I am one of the Enhanced Care Specialist Nurses here at Royal Bolton Hospital. Like David said, we work very closely together with our team. Um, apologies for Jessica, she can't be with us today for the webinar, um, so it's just myself. So our team started about a year ago by our service lead, Joy Redwood. Um, again, Joy unfortunately has had some Wi-Fi issues, so it's on the um, webinar today. I will leave her email address in the chat because she said any questions we can direct straight to her in case I can't answer any of them. So thank you everyone for coming. So uh, next slide please. So, like I said, the team was set up about a year ago and we were set up to work with people with cognitive impairments in the hospital. So we work with anyone ranging from um, diagnosis of dementia, new diagnosis of dementia, um, alcohol um, withdrawals, and a lot of our patients do have delirium that come through the doors. So every patient we do see um, in hospital is screened on admission. So we work very closely with A&E and we'll see a lot of patients in A&E. And if they get admitted, our team will go and screen them on our admission wards, recognise any changes of behaviour. And then we have a basis then to provide the rest of the care for their stay in hospital. Once they come into hospital um, onto our admission wards, we ask all nurses to do an Aloha risk assessment. So this is something that Joy, um, our service lead, created to help us identify the level of enhanced care that our patients need. So um, the risk assessment looks into their behaviours, how they're acting, mental health concerns. And from this, it will give us the level and the one-to-one -one support that patient will need. And it also identifies um, early onsets for de um, delirium. So we've noticed just from doing the um, Aloha's every shift, changes in behaviour. So we've got patients who may only be screening um, as a level one, level two, and then within a couple of hours, couple of days, maybe they may be up to a level four one-to-one -one care. Um, once we have the Malohas in place, we ask our teams on the wards and our own staff to complete ABC chart. So they will then um, complete them as evidence to why a person needs the extra observations. And we will use these to advocate for patients on discharge. So next slide, please. So in our, I don't know what the other trusts are like, but within our trust at Bolton, um, we have three different levels of enhanced care. So we have our level one and two patients, which we call the eyeball, maybe a risk of falls, but they just need frequent comfort, comfort rounds, making sure they've checked on every half hour to an hour, asking do they need the toilet, do they need to drink, just to make sure they're not at risk of falling. We have our level threes, which are the bay tags. Usually this is one member of staff, staff sat in a bay of either four or seven, watching all patients at a time. If they were to go behind a curtain with a patient, they would have to make sure because someone takes over to watch the rest of the patients in that bay. And then we have our level four, which are the one-to-one -to, -one to um, patients where they have to be within arm's reach at all times. Um, within the hospital, any patient with a um, identified delirium is usually pace, placed on a level three or four enhanced care. So it, it identifies to us as a team to go and support that ward. And I will send my staff out and the rest of the team to them wards to support with patient care. Um, next slide, please. 
So new to Bolton for us is a referral system. So with us being a relatively new team, um, we was just picking up most of our patients um, on admission. Um, but however, we've finally got a referral system in. So all our t um, wards in the hospital can refer to us. Um, they can tell us a reason why we need the enhanced care team support, whether it be a new diagnosis of dementia, mental health concerns, a new onset of delirium. Um, and we will work with them patients to try a bit of distraction therapy to help with their stay in hospital and help find triggers of behaviours for discharge. Um, next slide, please. So since our team started, um, Jessica, who couldn't be with us today, started the heightened behaviour flow sheet. I do apologise for the spelling of behaviour on here because I had not realised it was wrong after I sent the presentation off. So the heightened behaviour behavior flow sheet was um, approved by GMMH um, for us to use within the trust. So um, Jessica created this to try and um, identify early signs of um, delirium or what would could be causing a heightened behaviour with our patients. So we, we pre present this um, flow sheet on all our training now to um, international nurses, our newly qualified nurses and also to our healthcare assistants because it's good, beneficial for them to know and recognise a new sign and change in behaviour and whether that may lead to a delirium and um, tell the nurses about this. So um, yeah, like I said, we use this in all our training now. So next slide, please. So just an overview of what our team does. So as I've already said, it's myself and Jessica, which are the specialist nurses. Then under us, we have three band threes and 12 band twos. And we they work throughout the entire hospital, helping with patients with heightened behaviour, delirium, dementia. And a lot of the work we do is about distraction therapy and discharge planning for these patients. So... Our service um, usually runs based on our Monday morning meetings. So within this meeting, we work with GMMH, um, our integrated discharge team and safeguard, um, sometimes safeguarding to sit on with that and our learning disability team do. So we will um, have our Monday morning meeting, highlight all the patients in the hospital who are at risk or have challenging behaviours, and that will set us up for the week then. We'll uh, make sure the wards have all the help they need. They provide all our ABC data to help with discharge. We'll work with the discharge team to help with um, providing the correct data to get people out of hospital. Um, we was noticing that those patients that weren't being discharged or being declined from multiple care homes and with the support of our team and identifying the triggers for behaviour and um, those patients that would be um, being declined from maybe six or seven homes within a week or two of us inputting data and sending it off to the care homes. These patients were getting discharged to their forever, forever home. So we do a lot of work around discharge within our with our patients with delirium and dementia. Uh, for myself and Jessica, we review every patient in the hospital who would be a level four, level three enhanced care um, and may read all the um, data, read all the nursing notes. And we promote the use of our risk assessment being used on a daily basis or shift basis. And we'll support with all the MDTs on the wards. Um, they will make the wards aware that they can come to us, speak to us, and then we'll go on there and um, review all the patients. Um, next slide, please. So um, alongside David, um, our team also provides training for at the hospital. So we have our own enhanced care training. So it isn't a simulation like David's is, but um, it's more of an informal chat with our um, colleagues in the hospital. We try to get them to engage with us more when it's a bit more informal. We provide training to our health cares, newly qualified nurses, international nurses, and we now do micro teaching on the wards. We were noticing um, gaps on the wards for the nurses that have been with us for quite a few years and before our team started. So with the micro teaching, it's trying to target those staff members and try and make them aware of enhanced care and delirium and dementia and how we can provide that support in hospital. Um, as the nurse on the ward, we provide the management support. So we work very closely with our service lead, Joy, on the management side, but we su supervise all our Bantus, myself and Jessica, and make sure they um, are distributed safely throughout the hospital to the wards that need them most. Um, for us to identify the wards in most need, we have a database and every time a patient is um, input onto our electronic system as an enhanced care, we get a full report of that. And that sets us up for the day. Then I'll know where I need to provide the support for the health cares and I'll send them to the wards in most need and they will do evidence and gathering for me and work with the patients. And then, um, like I said, we help with ward pressures. So all our team is trained with bloods, cannulas, ECGs. And we, me and myself and Jessica, um, obviously with being nurses, help with medication if someone's struggling with that. So um, we do a lot of on-ward work. And 
as well, we have the time with um, the wards and them having so many patients, we have the time to spend an hour or two hours with a poor gentleman who may not be able to take his medications where the ward doesn't have that time to do that. And it's a nice part of our day to be able to sit with patients and make sure they get the care they deserve whilst in hospital. Um, next slide, please. Um, and that's everything from myself. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just coming in because I'm not so certain if um, Emma's able to join us due to her Wi-Fi problems. So, um, but that's a wonderful presentation from um, Bolton. Incredible work that's going on, folks. I don't know what you think. Um, there has been a couple of questions, if you don't mind me putting them to you, Ella. One yeah, of them of was, um, could you tell us a bit more about what the Aloha is, please? I think people weren't certain of what that, that was. Yeah. Um, and I've not heard of it either, actually. It sounds yeah. lovely. Is it Aloha? Am I saying it right? Yeah, so. yeah. Aloha, like in um, Hawaii. Yeah. Hawaii. So, <laughs> yeah, so the Aloha Risk Assessment um, is very, relatively new to Bolton. Um, so Joy created this. So at the moment, it's not official as we are awaiting to, we have to write papers and Joy has to get her model as um, the Redwood Way model approved by NHS England. So we've spoken to a few hospitals so they know about it but it's not officially out there yet we just are doing it as a test for change in our hospital and it's proven good work so fingers crossed it will get approved so the aloha looks at avoiding levels um i can't remember my name it's got off. yeah avoiding levels of harm um in assessment in hospital that's it so um it is a full risk assessment where it's asking our staff to um, answer yes or no questions so um on the ward they can access this through every patient's documents type in aloha and they just have ask, have to answer yes or no to about six or seven questions and that will then generate a score at the end that score will let us know if that patient's a level one care level two level um yeah level three or level four um anybody in our hospital who has mental health concerns or are on a mental health section will instantly qualify for a level four enhanced care um if we don't the other um factors within the risk assessment will um, generate a score and that'll let us know what level they need in our trust Hopefully that makes sense. Um, if I, I noticed there was a question about a hard copy, if I can um, access that, I will ask Joy, um, like I said, I'll put Joy's email in the chat so once I've finished. Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask Joy to provide some hard copies of the Aloha. That, that would be lovely. Um, again, um, Gopal's come in and said um, what a difference the enhanced care team have made well, in terms you. of the improvement for people with dementia and delirium at Bolton. So um a well done um fr from from gopal on that oh, there has gopal. been there's, there's been another question in relation to do people with is it level three i've lost the question uh, level three or level four is there an opportunity for them to go to that's it so why do level three or level four patients not go to intermediate care or discharge to assess yeah, so um, that was relatively a new. So I only joined the team in January and I believe that came in just before I started the team. So I'm unaware, like I said, this may be something more aimed at joy, whether it was to do with the false risk of patients. And in our IMC and D2A beds out here at Bolton, they're all individual rooms. And I think it was a staffing issue that for our level three and four patients, we couldn't safely provide care for them there. Um, we are at the, in the process of reevaluating our falls at the moment and looking at doing different types of um, low rise beds, crash mats and set fall sensors within our IMC, uh, IMC and D2A beds. If they are proven effective and hopefully we might be able to at least get our level threes out to IMC and D2A, but at the moment until it's safe for them to do so, we're trying to reduce falls within our um, trust so we can't let them go at the moment. Thank you for that response. Um, and there's been a response from a colleague who works in Manchester in intermediate care talking about um, they are able to take people with resolving delirium. So there's a lot of discussion Ooh. to be had about that, isn't there? So yeah, definitely. It, may, it, may be, it may be good to link you up. It's Louise Hilton from Manchester, I know. So, But ha what a wonderful um, presentation from yourself and David. And, and to, to be offering simulation training at a time when staff are really pushed and, and, and David's addressed that challenge about having staff released and you're delivering micro training as well. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. So thank you. A really good example, folks, here of a hospital working to best practice that, that we're really happy to share. So I think it's time to move on. I don't know if Emma's able to come in. I don't want to interrupt Emma um, if she is, but um, I think it's time to move on to our next presentation. And I'm... Um, 
so I'm not um, I'm going to continue as, as I'm not certain if Emma's around, but I'd love you to introduce you to um, Mel Safari, who has been working with ourselves in Greater Manchester um, in Dementia United, but also with our mental health colleagues in developing some fabulous resources and co-producing some resources um, with communities um, in terms of different languages. So I'm going to hand over to Mel now to do a proper introduction and um, I'll come in at the end, Mel, so thank you. That's all right. Hi, nice um, to meet you all and thank you for having me um, as part of today's um, discussions. So I'm, I'm Dr Mel Safari. I'm one of the co-founders and psychologists who work within the organisation called Lingua GM. We work across Greater Manchester with two um, diverse umbrellas. One where we provide direct interpreting translation services um, to all of our system and mental health supports across GM with our GPs right through to um, our hospitals and schools, home, housing, um, our, our city council team and also um, our wider um, community and voluntary sector engagement. Our other umbrella is direct mental health support, which is offered in first languages. We offer that in 10 different languages at the yes, moment. Can you, our oh, can you hear me? Mm. Yes, I can. Sorry, I just think somebody yeah. might have joined. It's not okay. on mute. Um, Sorry, Mel, keep so going. Our mental, it's okay. Our mental health work um, is offered with one-to-one -one support and also through group spaces and informal community psychoeducational um, sessions. And they're offered in 10 different languages across GM. Um, and as we know, We've got 200 different languages speak it, spoken across Greater Manchester, so it makes us a very wonderfully diverse city and all of us to be living in and very proud of to be part of. And I think at times we forget to give ourselves a pat on the shoulder to say what a diverse city we are. Um, and in terms of some of our work that we have done within the team, we've all got over 20, 30 years experience in different pockets and different areas within the sector and working across the, the system and the trust and bringing some of our knowledge and expertise right through to the community where people have got access to our um, experiences and our professional knowledge without long waiting times. And as we know, that happens across the sector and the system for, for many of our service users wanting to access um, support and treatment and care. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of hoping we are a team that we do things a little bit differently. Um, some of the work we have done, happy for you to go to the next slide, Helen. Some of the work we have done um, over the past 12 months uh, alongside Helen colleagues and our Dementia UK team has been around putting that bit of co-production work in place where we actually build in cultural appropriate and culturally sensitive access for those who are either at the early onset or who are experiencing signs and symptoms of delirium. Um, and especially as we know, with time of COVID and pandemic, a lot of those challenges and difficulties probably escalated even more and people weren't unsure and unaware, especially our bilinguals, where do I access services? And actually, if I'm experiencing these symptoms, what does that mean? And does that mean I'm having early onsets of delirium or actually does this link to other health issues and health impacts? So we've worked um, with the team and translated um, and put into audios and videos some of the um, documents and some of the information and some of the very um, simplified the resources that's very much around at the moment on the impact. Oh, and Mel, you've gone on to mute. I don't know how that's happened. Oh, I just noticed. Back with us. <laughs> I just noticed. Sorry, I don't know where I got muted up to. So some of the things what we've noticed is translating documents to simplified, really basic first language for our diverse community has been a key. And just getting that message across of actually what is delirium? How does delirium affect me? How do I access help? What does that mean for my wider connection, family, carers, support, my children, um, and, and actually what do I do? Where do I start from to, to, to sort of engaging with the GP and with community practitioners and organisation likes of us? How can I access those support? 
So those materials and documents, I think there is a link on the next slide, Helen, that has been shared um, with colleagues that, that all of those resources are accessible on Dementia UK's website. Um, and, and this is probably a really nice starting point just to kind of put a bit more of a, a focus on of how commissioning has changed and actually working within the system and the sector and doing that cross collaboration work with a small, medium sized organizations in the voluntary sector like Sabos brings such a valuable social and also health impact for our residents um, across our across our society and board and actually across GM. So we're very grateful and we're very um, humbled to be part of this journey and hope we build on this even more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. I think it moves on to me now, just following on really to just um, say a huge thank you to uh, Mel and all the different communities that you engaged with in order to take forward um, translating the resources. And I wondered, as this is a best practice um, session, um, I thought it would be useful to talk about some of the lessons we learned as we did the work together. Um, and that might be helpful for colleagues. So yes, we are sharing the resources. They are translated into 16 languages. There's an audio, as a film. It's the shortened version of the delirium leaflet. But I thought maybe that the how we did it would be of value. So next slide, please. Um, um, in terms of the feedback that we've received on the resources that we've already shared, um, we've been able to work with some of the, our colleagues who support people in these diverse communities and find out whether there's actually made a difference already having those translated resources. And so these quotes on this slide really just gives you a sense of what a difference it's already made. Um, and we work We've worked with a, a wide range of different groups to check and test out and co-produce those resources so that the language we use is culturally appropriate, the leaflets are clear, the images are um, engaged with people without actually being a barrier to people, um, so they're more inclusive. So, um, so these quotes just give you a sense of the difference that those resources have made. Next slide, please. So what are lessons have we learned? So, um, not too many, thank goodness, but what we learned was we needed to know what the need was. So we needed to make sure that we'd already engaged with people with lived experience and they were able to feed into us and tell us what they wanted from the resources. And we did that with a, a meeting with a number of colleagues from across different um, uh, groups in Manchester who, who indicated that it had to be in audio, it had to be in, in film form as well as written form. Um, it's important when we're doing this work, as Mel said, and I'm supporting what she's saying, that it's an overall approach. It's about partnerships and it's about those partnerships being more long term. So it's not just about doing one piece of work, but it's about developing that um, resource and then working with those organisations to take forward um, sharing that resource. So if you have something translated, how do you then share it and make sure it's available? to people um, and, and that it's used by different communities. Um, the expertise to undertake the work's really important. We have a fa fabulous trusted relationship, I have to say, um, with colleagues um, from Lingua and other different organisations that um, assisted with the translations. But it's important that you know when you're doing any work around translating any resource that you're certain of the skills, the knowledge and the expertise um, of the people undertaking that. And finally, um, the communication is really important. So for us, it was about not just thinking about um, who, but it's how are we going to get that information out? Social media, website, WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups. Um, there were suggestions of using um, TV channels. Somebody's adapted some of our resources and has done a film themselves, which they've put on a TV channel working with us. So. All of this is part of that overarching lesson learned that we did in, in translating the resources. Next slide, please, Fiona. Um, this just gives you a very quick indication of the numbers of people from the 2011 census and the languages that we went for. The areas highlighted in pink are where we have translated the resources. So we haven't covered all languages um, as yet, but um, a, a good percentage of languages we've covered with the resources that we've got. Um, next slide, please. 
So taking forward the lessons learned, what could you do if you were wanting to translate any resources, not just around delirium, but around anything that you want to do? Um, we found the following was really important to have an initial meeting to scope out with your different community groups, the diverse groups that we've worked with to establish what the need is. From that, um, it's really important to agree a specification that you both agree that's really important and then have further meetings to explore that further and really to talk about your aims in translating, who your audience is, the time scale and, and how things will be signed off. So, so this is really important um, and I think it's just valuable to share that how we did that and we'd be more than happy to, to talk you through that process um, Mel and colleagues and myself, if, if anybody's interested in, in any translation work. Next slide, please. I think that draws me to a close. Um, so just things about your specification to cover if you were writing one. So I think I'll, I'll move on from that. Thank you. Just so we can catch up a little bit. Thank you, Fiona. Next slide. OK, so um, Emma's come back in. <laughs> I'm going to step away from just quickly um, chairing on behalf of Emma and also it means I can have a, a drink of water because my voice is going so thank you very much I don't know if anybody's any questions we can't hear you Emma I don't know if you muted Emma sorry do you want me to carry on OK, I'll carry on then. So <clears throat> it seems like Emma's got a connection problem again. So thank you very much for your comments in the chat um, about the all the different contributions from across Greater Manchester. And the other thing is, and thank you, um, Emma, for saying um, in the chat and um, with all the bad press that we get, the NHS um, really could see the work that's been going on. So thank you for that, which leaves me now to um, hand over to. Fabulous colleagues from Trafford. Um, Caroline Harvey and Francine Whitaker, what can I say? They've been great at um, getting involved with the delirium work really early on from the Community Enhanced Care Service, one of the first teams um, at, at, in the pandemic to step forward and say they'd like to test out our Community Delirium Toolkit, which was amazing to do given all the pressures on um, urgent care teams at the time. So um, Caroline and Francine um, have been working with us. They'll, they'll um, obviously, um, introduce themselves a bit more than I can do. But what I can say is they've learned a lot. They're very happy to share what they've learned, the ups and downs, which is really important because it has been a challenge in implementing change um, during the pandemic and post pandemic. So I'm handing over to yourselves, Caroline and Francine. Many thanks. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see so many atten attendees. Uh, so I'm Caroline. I'm currently a trainee ACP. I wasn't when we started the project. Um, and this is Francine, she's one of our nurse practitioners and we're in the uh, community enhanced care team. And we piloted the toolkit, which includes the 4AT assessment, the time bundle and the patient information leaflets in 2020. And at the time of the pilot, there were about 35 staff in our team, so relatively small team. Um, and we've been asked to present the challenges. I must apologise, I think the room next door is having a party. There's a bit of clapping on, so... We won't nip out and join the party, but just if you hear any clapping and wooing, it's not us. Um, uh, so could could we have the next slide, please? So, yeah, when we expressed an interest, um, like Helen says, um, of becoming part of the delirium, we, we weren't aware that there was a global pandemic around the corner. So this was quite a challenge at the time. Um, our therapy team, which was about six therapists, were redeployed. Um, so we were left with less staff as well and obviously lots of uncertainty. However, we wanted to carry on because um, our, the main aim of our team is to prevent people going into hospital. And with increasing COVID cases and pressures on the services, uh, we felt that we might have contributed to less people being admitted to hospital due to a delirium. Um, we initially identified three main people who were um, the lead leads for the project with the aim of sharing the workload and not having pressure on individuals um, and we access support through Helen and Dementia United through teams because we weren't allowed face-to-face -face meetings. On reflection though this could be seen as quite a positive thing as we had access to many more professionals um, such as Emma you know you wouldn't necessarily meet up with a consultant from various specialities across Manchester face-to-face -face. so we, we saw that as quite a positive looking back. 
um, having the three project leads also meant that we had a representative or had tried to have a representative at every meeting, which enabled us to keep the continuity and momentum going. i just pass you over to Fran Cavill. Next slide, please. Hi, I'm Francie. Nice to meet you all. Um, as mentioned on the last slide, time was another challenge due to service pressures, demands and sickness. But the, the, the decision was made to bite the bullet despite time constraints and the situation with COVID. Each project lead was involved with staff teaching and training, which included some small face-to-face -face sessions when allowed and online sessions before the rollout. This was for all levels of staff who were patient facing. We decided to roll out the teaching quickly over a period of two weeks and we were able to provide mock-up sessions for those staff who may have missed out. Again, this helped with momentum and continuity and staff were engaged with the project and process from the beginning. Initially, we only used the toolkit for patients to refer to our urgent care team to give staff the opportunity to become familiar with the assessments and paperwork. We were no, in no rush to roll out to the long-term conditions team until all the staff felt comfortable and confident with its use. It was relatively easy to gain feedback as we are a small team. Next slide. So another challenge that we faced was the expansion of the project and engagement with other services within the locality. We did reach out to other services and um, regarding the toolkit, but we had little response. But I acknowledge this was probably due to the fact that there was, again, a global pandemic um, and other teams and services have different pressures and demands and ongoing projects. So to address this, we, we offered information and teaching very informally. We went, we went across to other teams if we could. Um, and therapy teams and district nursing teams within Trafford did engage with that. But we, at no point did we put pressure on them to participate or how much they wouldn't have to participate. And uh, interested parties were invited to the delirium groups um, and the decision to attend again, it was their choice, it wasn't mandatory. We found that individuals dipped in and out and this was accepted um, from all involved and invitations were kept open. Next slide, please. Keeping momentum was one of the biggest challenges. One of the project leads left the service a year into the pilot. Illness and staff undertaking study meant that enthusiasm was variable at times. To address this, one of the project after one of the project leads left, we recruited another interested member of staff to be involved so we could maintain as much engagement as possible. We tried to ensure all staff were updated in a timely manner to avoid any change fatigue and keep momentum. We also provided feedback, audit data in different formats to keep people interested. For example, at team meetings, specific delirium meetings or safety huddles. Next slide, please. Whilst governance is vital when implementing such projects, we found it challenging and it was in a barrier in some instances. Once the pilot was completed, the focus was on implementing the toolkit doc documentation into standard practice. However, it seemed to take a very long time to gain trust approval and the go ahead to move forward. On reflection, perhaps if we had have identified the key stakeholders earlier in the process, we may have been able to remove some of these barriers. Patience and persistence are key when trying to drive the project. However, this was not the project lead's main focus or job role. We were still part of a wider team providing patient care. This could be considered a limitation of having such a small team. Next slide, please. So to conclude, um, the key challenges that we faced when implementing the pilot were timing, time, engagement, momentum and barriers such as governance. We attempted to address the challenges by ensuring that we had three project leads to distribute the workload and rolled out the initial training quickly to ensure engagement. It was probably easier than we thought it would be due to the small team size. We also offered support and training to potentially interested teams without placing undue pressure on them. We continually provided updates and education as needed within the team whilst trying not to overburden staff due to the complexities of change. 
We tried to be patient and persistent whilst driving the project forward. But a lot of the success of the pilot and subsequent implementation of the toolkit, which is now standard practice, is due to the ongoing support from Helen, Emma and Dementia United, as a lot of our team have no experience of implementing change in practice. And we're doing it from a very bottom up approach. Um, going forward, we're continually actively involved in the ongoing delirium work within our locality. Thank you. That's everything. Fantastic. I'm back. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, fantastic. So a quick question, because we um, are just spot on with time. Um, did you um, use the um, toolkit in delirium management in the community? Was it just for people in their own homes or was it for nursing home residents as well? Anybody that was referred to us, so it didn't matter where. We, we, our, most of our referrals with delirium tended to be from patients at home, but we would use it anywhere. Fantastic. Um, and um, I take it you'll be happy for anybody who uh, well wants to get in touch directly or um, in touch with Helen and myself in terms of sort of our coordinating role. But if you, um, um, yeah, thank you so much for all that you've done and continue to do. That's been really good to hear from you again. Um, so um, thank you so much to all of our speakers, even though I my connection failed. Um, I did manage to get back in um, and I just want to feed back to all the speakers some of the um, the feedback that's been going on in the chat. Um, I'm hoping I can quote you on this if you're still here, Jonathan. Um, Jonathan Kay has said, in my 30 years as a GP, one of the best webinars I have attended, all contributors should be very proud. And I think that um, the other reflection is it's just such practical um, work it's actually making a difference to the citizens of Greater Manchester and in fact beyond. So um, a few sort of um, rounding up sort of comments. Um, please um, do feedback using Mentimeter. Now I don't know is there going to be a slide with that code that comes up? Um, yes, it's all here. And, and also, sorry, thanks particularly, I forgot to mention to Helen, but also to Fiona Black, who's been, I can see, involved in all the practicalities and making this all run really smoothly in the background. Thank you so much. So yeah, please type in Mentimeter and the code or scan in the QR code. Um, and I'm not sure if this is going to happen in real time. The question will appear if you just type in your responses, which are anonymous, and then they'll appear on the screen. It, and those will. It will happen in real time. So Emma, if it's right. okay with you, we're just going to use yeah. the last five minutes Go ahead. to um, shift to Mentimeter itself and um, the QR code will come up and people can then actually put in some feedback, which is anonymous. So sorry for taking the slide down that you were reading, yeah. Emma. <laughs> is that okay? Fiona's going to yeah, put up fine. the Mentimeter. And are we going to see the Mentimeter results in real time? Yes. Yeah. So okay. um, if it works, if it works. So, so 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 far, there's about four or five people in. Oh, they're already putting in feedback. Thank you. So um, wow. So it comes up on a screen and Fiona will scroll down, scroll down and we'll all be able to see the feedback. Um, so because we asked what three things will people take away from today in order to be raising awareness? If you're not able to get onto Mentimeter, and I understand it can be a bit hard to do, that's absolutely fine. Feel free to put an answer to those to this question in the chat. So we are interested in what three things you'll take away from today in order to take forward raising awareness. So um, a few have said lived experience, I see, Emma, and I'm going to hand back to you now if you can see that screen. So sorry for stepping in. No, no problem at all. Um, so great to see those comments coming through. And um, I'm assuming is there, will it wait? Will it wait for like, surely not 140 or so responses. Um, but will the next question like around that be coming up? Um, There's a second question, isn't there? What would you like to see in future webinars? Will that come up on Mentimeter or is that just to, for people to feedback separately through the QR code? Yes. Oh, it's already happening. Fantastic. So um, excellent. But we've had more really great feedback. So we're definitely along the right um, track. And I think I just want to encourage everybody. What you've seen today is sort of uh, sort of to, at a certain stage of people's journeys. I'm not saying the end because it's an ongoing piece of work, but, you know, is taken in some cases 
some you know several months for all of that work to happen and to put things in place and i would just encourage you all it just shows what is possible um which with you know some passion enthusiasm and putting patients um at the center of what what we do um so i am just going to um uh, round off by saying again thank you to everybody keep providing some feedback we'll be sharing and promoting all the delirium resources we'll send them to you and um, there'll also be a recording that will go on youtube and um, we're going to have a further webinar later in 2023 let us know if you would like to present on anything and um, the you know the best um topics are the ones that people are involved in and you know they are uh, absorbing and interesting um and you know provide us all with some energy and a reminder we really need um, to make sure we have your email details if we don't have that already please um make sure that you um let us know that so we can be sharing the slides and links to resourcing and the other resources um so is there anything further before we round off helen I don't think so. It's just to say it's it's astounding that we've had 156 people in total join us today and that we've had so much wonderful feedback. So um, we do appreciate people joining us, given the amount of time that you have to commit to this. And hopefully you'll be taking away messages from today. But I'd like to thank Emma as chair, who um, has had to struggle with um, being in a care home environment with restricted Wi-Fi. So but there was a hand up there, Emma. I don't know if somebody just wanted to ask us a question, which we're more than happy to answer if there was a quick question in our last minute. I don't know if that was a, a hand up to ask us something or just a hand up to say thank you. I don't know. So, Yeah, if there is anybody with a hand up, feel free to leap in. We've got one minute left. Otherwise, we'll just keep taking all the responses and the hand clapping and the great feedback <laughs> and um, anything. And we'll wind up. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. I will stop the recording. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, there is a hand up. Sorry, do come in. Is it Beverly? Uh, you're more than welcome to everything was how good everything was um and just sort of like thinking about over my nursing career or thinking if i had this so many years ago it would have been much more of a positive outcome for uh, my patients that i looked after and thanks to john for sharing his story wow thank you very much beverly for coming in and, and giving that um lovely feedback to us all and to john really appreciate it